So, I just cannot tell you how happy I am to be here with you today. It's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to be here among my good friends at the City Club of Chicago. And I can also tell you it's better to be seen than viewed. <laughs> So I had a plan, or so I thought. I was planning on running for mayor. And in doing so, I intended to lift up the voices of marginalized people in the city of Chicago. And those are the same people who I feel and who people around me feel have been ignored and overlooked by the current administration. And that means I was planning on beating the incumbent and help restore some justice, equity, and democracy on the fifth floor of City Hall. That also meant that if my mayoral motorcade was blowing through red lights, I was planning <laughs> on digging deep into my purse to pay those fines. I'm not going to play because you know there's so many of you all out here on that other side. <laughs> so, do I regret not being able to implement my plan? And regret is too strong of a word. I have no regrets. At least I made God laugh. If anything, this experience has made me even more compassionate towards those who have greater challenges before them. Having a greater capacity for compassion will make me into a stronger leader, not just in my union, but also in my community and in my nation. While there were no flashing lights and no visions of my 61 years on this planet, my health scare has done much to really increase my focus. I have a renewed outlook. I can also tell you that when the doctors presented us with the diagnosis, I didn't really worry about what would happen to me. I was more concerned about my husband, John, who's right there, and what would happen <laughs> What would happen to tens of thousands of people across the city who are crying for new political leadership. The people who were building a movement for more just Chicago, and the same people who were counting on me to take on the mayor. But I gotta say this. Can I say this? It was a little odd watching the news and seeing reporters speaking of me in past tense. I kept pinching myself thinking, I'm still here, right? Is there something someone wants to tell me? Because if this is the afterlife, it looks a whole lot like my dining room. <laughs> That's true. So for me, this was just another challenge, another fight. Even if this time, it's very personal. And, you know, I've been underestimated before. So even though I couldn't run from here, I knew it was not the end of the world. It was an unfortunate moment in our movement. And all we had to do was switch lanes. <laughs> And it's why I asked Commissioner Garcia to mount a campaign for mayor. I knew Chewy would be able to fight for what our city, for our city, for more than three decades. He's been in the forefront of strengthening neighborhoods. He is the leader with a keen understanding of the financial crisis looming in Chicago. And yet he possesses the moral courage to make really tough choice of not throwing poor people 
and working families under a CTA bus. <laughs> I know, right? We just switched lanes. This is sort of a relay race. I simply pass the baton to the better runner ahead of me. I know that's supposed to be baton. Okay. I'm sorry. I was always a fat girl. I never know about racing. Sorry. <laughs> At least I used to be. <laughs> That's why I'm also backing several people for the city council, including members of the Progressive Caucus. I'm also supporting everyday people who have the courage to stand up for what they believe, like David Moore in the 17th and teachers, clinicians, and members of the Chicago Teachers Union, like Tara Stamps in the 37th, sitting over there. <laughs> Sue Sedlowski Garza in the 10th. And Tim Egan in the 33rd. People are tired of status quo, aldermanic cheerleaders who appear to be nothing more than you know what, Beholden to certain people, to one person. And it's crazy hedge fund homies. Are you all here, the crazy hedge fund homies? Are you all come? They come, right? Okay. Well, they're tired of being represented by people who agree with privatizing public assets, the stealing of our pensions while they protect their own. That's a problem. Those city council members who think it's okay to vilify hard working teachers paraprofessionals, and clinicians. Tired of city council members who are, who are complicit by their silence. As the mayor's hand-picked board closed 50 schools, yes, I said it, y'all did it. Even Jesse Ruiz, who kindly walked in with me, sorry, you shouldn't have closed those schools. <laughs> I'm upset. I'm gonna actually leave y'all alone today. People are tired of elected officials who think it's okay to lie to the President of the United States about the length of our school day because they are desperate to win. I think it's a shame when the President is on the radio repeating a lie that was disproved. We have the shortest school day in the country, in the whole world, and blah, 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 blah. That was a lie. And the people that even organized it admitted it and laughed about it later. And yet we're still here because some people have access and some people don't. And when you have access, you can tell the same lie over and over and over again and people will believe it. Why? Because they heard it again and again. The longer school day myth is just as bad as the STEM myth now being propagandized across the country. I'd like to know where all these vacancies that are gonna go unfilled when Microsoft laid off 18,000 workers, STEM workers. Microsoft laid off 18,000, I wanna say that to you. But we are still pushing STEM. Why are we doing that? Well, it's another tactic of the ruling class to decrease wages in this protracted war on the middle class. So you know, as I think of it, it's patently unfair that these people get to clamor for the heads of teachers as they call for accountability. I was just talking to Bruce. Well, how will we know what our kids are doing? The third grade teacher is different from the fourth grade teacher. I'm like, we know what we're doing. We know how to assess children. We're actually trained to do that. Having a test that's supposedly objective still tells us nothing about our children other than their socioeconomic status and specifically the educational attainment of the mother. That's what the tests tell us. They still don't give us, and then we don't even get to see the results of the test. We don't get to see the test, we don't get to see the real results where the kid made a mistake, where they didn't. How do I use that as diagnostic information? I'm all for diagnostic tests. But I'm not for a call for accountability by high stakes tests
because it's what you use that information for. You use that information incorrectly, mean-spiritedly, to ruin people's lives, children, adults, and by people that are always saying, I'm for the kids, <laughs> who've never spent a minute with kids, but they're for the kids. I have a problem with that. So how do we hold those people? Who holds the hedge fund homies responsible? You know, other than we go protest in front of your offices. But really, seriously, we have been talking about a crisis in education since I was a baby. Think about it. And I'm not sure if we are looking for the perfect to replace the good or the better. I'm not sure. But as long as I can remember, we have talked about America falling behind. We did it in the 50s, but we can go all the way back to the late 1800s when we were complaining. Business was at the start of that too, because they wanted to teach curricular and career and technical ed, or as they used to call it in the old days, voc ed. Push that down to the high school so they wouldn't have to train. I think that's where we are again. We are still branding the system as a failure. So we can start tearing it down brick by brick. That's not acceptable. <laughs> Who has been held for the foreclosure crisis that we see now? The greatest reduction of wealth among the middle class in our nation's history has been directly tied to the housing. And we see it here in Chicago, in my neighborhood. Who has been held accountable for the rampant pension thefts, for the destruction of American jobs, and for the unjust murders of unarmed black men? Who's been held accountable for any of that? These education policies have been disastrous from New York to LA. The private-public partnership means private. Private employees will be overworked and underpaid and living in constant fear of losing their jobs. Be glad you have a job. Shut up. Do what I tell you. Public. No jobs, a tax on pensions, benefits, and health care. I just got a bill for $78,000. I'm fortunate that I have reasonable health care. It could be better. Francis. <laughs> Just letting you know. But what happens to the families who are one illness away from catastrophic disaster and financial ruin? Something is wrong in our nation when the top 1% continue to siphon every resource available from the 99% trapped on the bottom rung. And sending kids to charter schools and giving them vouchers isn't going to change that. It's not going to change that. I'm sorry. I left out of the clear stuff. But it's not. It's not. I guess this private public crowd is happy now that one of their buddies was able to purchase a 10th house, the governor's raggedy mansion in Springfield. <laughs> around a round platform about nothing. Yet, in the days of taking office, the real rounder is starting to emerge. He's wasted no time attacking the wages of working class people, attacking their labor unions, and threatening massive cuts to social service programs, which help the most vulnerable people in our state. That's the real Bruce Rauner, and he's not some easy-going, blue-jean-wearing, $20 watch-having good guy who's coming to save the day. He is Scott Walker on steroids. And he is a person who's made it his mission to vilify the Chicago Teachers Union 
I still don't know why he can't say my name without spitting, and we <laughs> never had a bad conversation. But it, he's going to vilify the CTU for no other reason than our opposition to the vicious attacks on our character, classrooms, and our students. We won't apologize for standing up for what's right for children. We will not ever be silent in the face of austerity. We will not. This is a governor who has admitted that he is only interested in the strivers. This means that the real rounder thinks that only certain people are worthy of a high quality education. He does not believe that every child should have one, only those who he deems the strivers. This type of thinking will only further class divisions and increase conflicts. The real rounder is also busy trying to make the term collective bargaining into dirty words. If there is any silver lining, it is in the fact that no governor can rule by fiat. He's going to have to learn to work with the General Assembly. <laughs> But I just love that idea. <laughs> He's going to have to learn to listen to everyday citizens that he spent nearly $30 million of his own money to represent. And he's going to have to learn to work with organized labor. <laughs> the Chicago Teachers Union is currently negotiating its new bargaining agreement. We're in the early stages right now. We don't know if the mayor's handpicked board of education, that's you, Jesse, put that up. <laughs> See how he does? Just like he does during public comments, sitting there on his little. <laughs> Boy, you would have so many detentions if you were in my class. I'm sorry, I can't resist. <laughs> so we're in the early stages right now, and we don't know if the Board of Education will make the same mistakes it made three years ago that sent 30,000 people to the picket line. If they do, I assure you, we will be prepared. Every time friends they would say something crazy at the table, I would just do this to me. Yeah. Oh no, Lewis, that's not what we want. <laughs> Ultimately, though, it's up to them. We met their threshold before, we can meet it again. There's some guy who, in the General Assembly right now who's trying to get the same uh, uh, bill passed for the rest of the state that it got for Chicago, about 75% of its members. Will somebody tell these people not to poke the bear? Tell them not to poke the bear. These guys must know you. Tell them that this is not the way to go. Don't tell people what they can't do. Not grown people, not people who can read and do a right. <laughs> so make no mistake about it. Teachers and other school employees are demoralized because there are climates of fear in our schools. While we were able to win considerable gains in our last contract, other problems are crippling our district. Principals covered by autonomy are enticed with a form of merit pay. But it also allows them to segregate their faculties. The largest school in this city where I taught for 15 years and my husband taught for, how long did you teach there, baby? 28 years. Has no black male faculty. Lane Tech, how does that happen? How do you have not one single black male teacher? How do you have a school that has nobody, the, oh, I'm tired, sorry, one person over the age of 40? How do you have a school like that? Principal autonomy. That is outrageous. Merit pay. This competition for coins leads those principals to create conditions in their buildings that are adverse 
to collaboration. Some principals are so far gone that they believe teachers should stand on their feet all day. There are no desks for teachers in some buildings in the city of Chicago. No random acts of teaching. They will put that on the board, no random acts of teaching. They will tell you not to do that. That is where the joy of education lies, in your random acts. That's what you remember. Nobody in here remembers their favorite standardized test, but you all remember who your favorite teacher was. I saw it on Twitter. They want Stepford teachers and children of the corn kids who are compliant. See, y'all get me started. You invited me back. Much face back. And I'm crankier now, you notice? So that's what they really want. Stepford teachers. We're going to build the perfect teacher because if we build the perfect teacher, I'm here to tell you there are no standardized teachers. So if you build the person for perfect teacher, you slam and you look at the kids and you give them hand signals and they sit down and shut up and do what they're told. What are you building? What are you building? What you are building is people who will be compliant and will not challenge authority or the system or look for ways to eradicate inequality, poverty, and injustice. This district is focused on testing, testing, testing. We are boring children to death, and then after all of that, we're punishing them. In the coming days, we will present our contract demands and what type of investment the board will make to ensure every child has a world-class education. If you want well-resourced schools, educators with tenure and job security, it's going to cost money. We shouldn't shy away from this. Great working conditions for educators are also great learning conditions for our students. Our new contract will reflect our values as educators. The election is about the same kind of values. We stand in solidarity with every parent in calling and standing up for more resources with every local school council leader who champions the cause of true education, with every activist working to strengthen their communities despite rampant disinvestment and political meddling. The movement we have started in Chicago will intensify and expand. That is why today we are releasing our blueprint, Adjust Chicago, fighting for the city our students deserve. In the area of employment, Adjust Chicago would eliminate employment discrimination, guarantee jobs that pay a living wage, and provide health insurance for families of Chicago students. It would offer racially and economically integrated schools with vibrant curricula for all students. In the area of justice, Adjust Chicago would end discrimination in arrests and sentencing, and provide alternatives to imprisonment for non-violent offenders. <laughs> Treat first-time non-violent drug offenders instead of jailing them. Provide troubled students with additional counselors, social support services, and programs that implement restorative justice practices in the schools. Make available mentoring programs, summer jobs, and school-based mental health clinics to help address the impact of neighborhood violence. Have a democratically elected representative, civilian police review board. In the area of housing, a just Chicago would address the affordable housing and crisis of students in temporary living situations. We're not calling them homeless kids anymore. We're calling them students 
in temporary living situations, greatly increased the number of affordable and, how, and homeless housing units, that's for everybody, not just our students, built across the city, including in wealthier and highly resourced neighborhoods. Create affordable rental housing, regularly inspected for building code violations with decreased numbers of evictions. In the area of health, Adjust Chicago would provide trauma centers, urgent care clinics, mental health clinics, and other needed health care centers in all neighborhoods, particularly those currently lacking health services. Rebuild the diminished lead poisoning prevention programs. Increase the number of school-based health clinics and increase the staffing level of nurses, social workers, and other school clinicians. In the area of education, a just Chicago would insist on equitable funding policies, including taxes on financial transactions and reduced dependence on property taxes. Provide full day, developmentally appropriate pre-kindergarten to all who wanted it, but not use pre-K to enrich financial companies with public money. Guarantee full funding for every school and have a democratically elected representative school board. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is what we want on February 24th. And this is what we want in our contract. Thank you again and a special thanks to my husband John, who has been my rock through this ordeal, to CTU officers Jesse, Michael, and Christine for their friendship and leadership during this transition period. And Audrey, my executive assistant, Stephanie Gavlin, my media relations coordinator, and all the staff at CTU for their hard work, dedication, leadership, and support. I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you.